Greetings. Let us talk about portal vein thrombosis in a patient with cirrhosis. How do you manage this patient? I would like to thank many who support this venture. And please read this notice. So, when you see a patient with cirrhosis, uh, Patients with cirrhosis can present with uh, portal venous thrombosis as an incidental finding that you may find during routine ultrasound surveillance every six months. That's one way. And uh, the second way is they can present with uh, acute abdominal pain and uh, hepatic decompensation. So, how do you diagnose portal vein thrombosis? Uh, it's typically by using an ultrasound of the abdomen with the utilization of Doppler. And whenever you see portal vein thrombosis, it is important to figure out whether it is a bland thrombus or is it a tumor thrombus. Because patients with cirrhosis are at risk for hepatocellular cancer, and that cancer can also uh, invade the portal vein and cause a tumor thrombus. This is very important to figure out. And in order to figure this out, after Doppler in a patient with cirrhosis, you should follow up with a triphasic CT or MRI scan. And uh, when you perform a triphasic CT or MRI scan, you will see a tumor thrombus because of arterialization of the thrombus inside the portal vein. And uh, that is important to figure out. So if it is a tumor thrombus, then unlike a bland thrombus, uh, where you need to consider about anticoagulation in tumor thrombus, there is no role for anticoagulation. So that's one concept you have to keep in mind. In a cirrhotic patient, figure out is it a bland thrombus or a tumor thrombus. The next one is anytime you see a portal venous thrombosis, you need to figure out how far down does it go, does it go into the mesenteric veins, and does it cause bowel ischemia? And if you notice bowel ischemia, usually patients will have pain in the infraumbilical area. And they may have ileus, they may also have leukocytosis, they may have lactic acidosis, their LDH may be elevated. So when you see bowel ischemia, uh, it's important to start anticoagulation as long as there is no contraindication. And you should involve a surgeon to see if the patient needs surgery, especially if there is obvious infarction of the small intestine. Uh, these patients are likely to be very sick, and it requires a team approach, a, an intensivist, a surgeon, an interventional radiologist, a hematologist, as well as a gastroenterologist slash hepatologist. So we talked about thrombus, tumor versus bland, and the impact of the thrombus on the small bowel, whether there is ischemia or infarction. So let us talk about uh, antithrombotic management in patients with portal vein thrombosis or portal venous thrombosis in the setting of cirrhosis. If you find a thrombus in the intrahepatic branches, then uh, you shouldn't jump and start anticoagulation. You could consider observation with an ultrasound Doppler every three months because some of this thrombus could actually uh, resolve spontaneously. If it extends, then you should consider anticoagulation. 
On the other hand, if there is a main portal vein thrombus, then the next step is to figure out how big is this thrombus. Does it uh, uh, involve less than 50% of the uh, uh, vein, in which case you could consider observation, again with ultrasound Doppler, every three months. And if the thrombus increases in size to above 50%, then you should consider anticoagulation. On the other hand, if you have a main portal vein thrombus that is more than 50% to 100%, you should consider anticoagulation. Anticoagulation in a cirrhotic patient is safe. It has uh, uh, portal vein thrombosis actually interferes with the liver transplantation. Uh, so when you see a partial thrombus in the setting of cirrhosis, who is a candidate for liver transplantation, again, you can start anticoagulation. And uh, it's also been shown that anticoagulation cuts down the, the risk of uh, worsening of portal hypertension. So when it comes to anticoagulation in cirrhotic patients, what are the options? We have several uh, options. We have intravenous unfractionated heparin, subcutaneous injection twice a day of low molecular weight heparin, oral warfarin once a day, and oral direct acting oral anticoagulants either once a day or twice a day depending upon the medication that we use. So among these uh, different medications, uh, what uh, options will you consider to initiate therapy? So there are two options, uh, intravenous uh, low molecular weight, uh, intravenous unfractionated heparin or subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. In terms of efficacy, low molecular weight heparin is better than intravenous unfractionated heparin. Again, it is also safer uh, in terms of the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia because it is a smaller molecule. Low molecular weight heparin is a smaller molecule than unfractionated uh, heparin. But the disadvantage is it has a longer half-life compared to unfractionated heparin, which is few minutes to less than two hours versus uh, six to 12 hours. And uh, compared to unfractionated heparin, uh, low molecular weight heparin does not require any monitoring. If you have renal failure patient, uh, it is contraindicated. Low molecular weight heparin is contraindicated in renal failure patients. And if you have renal failure patients, you go with intravenous infusion of unfractionated heparin. So you, when you see a patient, you look at several different things. Uh, whether the patient has been exposed to heparin in the past, was at high risk for uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, you may go with a low molecular weight heparin. And if the risk of bleeding is not very big, then low molecular weight heparin because half-life is longer. On the other hand, risk of bleeding is high and you want to stop and reverse the medication quickly, then intravenous heparin is the way to go. And if you have a patient with renal failure, you go with uh, unfractionated heparin. So these are all things you want to keep in mind when you're starting therapy. How about once you start therapy and you're planning to discharge a patient, you need to consider options for maintenance therapy, and we have three options, low molecular weight heparin, oral warfarin, and oral direct acting oral anticoagulants. So among these three options, low molecular weight heparin can be used in liver disease, warfarin can be used in liver disease, but when it comes to direct uh, acting oral anticoagulants, the experience is limited 
and some of the medications are contraindicated. Uh, so when you have a patient and you're worried about absorption of the oral drugs because of edema of the gut, then you should go with low molecular weight heparin. And when the patient has a liver cancer, a malignancy, then low molecular weight heparin is preferred compared to other medications. And then when you have renal failure, then low molecular weight heparin is not the way to go. You can still g giving warfarin. There's no need to dose change. And uh, direct acting oral anticoagulation, uh, coagulant is another option. And uh, one disadvantage of warfarin, it requires monitoring compared to other medications. So you look at, among all these medications, warfarin is very cheap, but it requires monitoring and uh, something to keep in mind. So coming to how long are you going to treat? In a patient with cirrhosis, if there is a precipitating factor, like some form of you know, inflammation in the abdomen, a patient develops thrombosis after either diverticulitis or a little bit of pancreatitis or a little bit of cholecystitis, uh, or if the patient had surgery, abdominal surgery, any type of abdominal surgery, uh, or, or, or had trauma, a precipitating factor, you can elicit in the history, and there is no prior history of thrombosis and no family history of thrombosis, then you could stop treatment after six months. So that's the way to go. On the other hand, if you do not identify a precipitating factor, uh, in cirrhosis, you may not find precipitating factor, uh, either because of slow flow state as well as an imbalance between the procoagulants and anticoagulants, you can still develop uh, thrombosis. Uh, and you should consider thrombophilic uh, testing if the patient had prior history of thrombosis or if the patient had uh, uh, fam as a, has a family history of thrombosis. You should consider thrombophilia testing. Otherwise, in cirrhosis, we do not routinely do thrombophilia testing unless there are some other uh, signals to indicate that. This is uh, slightly different in patients without cirrhosis. In patients without cirrhosis, if there is no precipitating factor, you should consider thrombophilic testing. So that's one thing. So if the patient with cirrhosis is going to be listed for transplantation, then you want to maintain that portal vein patency and uh, so that surgery is going to be a little bit easier for the surgeon. So when you have any of these uh, uh, conditions, you should consider indefinite therapy. So we talked about uh, uh, management of thrombosis. Thrombosis in the portal system can exacerbate uh, portal hypertension and how do you manage portal hypertension in the setting of a patient with cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis and you should give preference to anticoagulation. You shouldn't be waiting for an endoscopy and other things. You should start your anticoagulation and you do the endoscopy and if the patient has high risk varices, large varices, varices with the red whale sign, then the preferred option is non-selective beta blocker. If there are small varices, low risk varices, then you follow the protocol, bring them back again for repeat endoscopy at a later date. If for some reason the patient has a contraindication for non-selective beta blockers, then you go with band ligation. So when it comes to band ligation in a patient with cirrhosis, you have started them an anticoagulation. Should you stop it or not? Uh, current uh, guidance is to hold anticoagulation uh, prior to banding. And when you look at it, uh, there are some uh, smaller series which have reported safety of band ligation where the patient is taking anticoagulation. But for now, until we have 
lot more evidence uh, the guidance is to hold anticoagulation i hope uh, this is helpful we talked about portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis key concepts are figure out is it a tumor thrombus or a bland thrombus a rule out ischemia of the small bowel when it comes to anticoagulation initiation of therapy unfractionated heparin versus low molecular weight heparin maintenance therapy low molecular weight heparin warfarin and doax duration of therapy prostrating factor present 6 months no prostrating factor or listed for liver transplant indefinitely and then also don't forget about management of portal hypertension preferably with non selective beta blockers and if you need to do banding consider holding anticoagulation thank you and uh, this is the a resource that i used i want to thank these authors uh, for helping me to understand this topic better and i hope this is helpful thank you